Hello there. So in this video, I want to calculate the moment of inertia of a disk just through the direct definition of moment of inertia. No fancy tricks. I'm just going to directly use the definition of moment of inertia. So I have some disk of mass m and it's a disk with a uniform mass density, right? So I'm rotating this disk about an axis that's passing straight through the center of the disk, right? This is a top-down view, and right, we can imagine this disk just rotating flat about this uh, about this center axis. And so, in order to calculate this moment of inertia, first we can break our little disk into a bunch of little infinitesimal mass units, right? And each of these is going to have some dm, and it's going to occupy some infinitesimal area, dA, right? And we'll look into the nature of this little infinitesimal area element uh, shortly. But we know that each of these little mass units, they're going to have some distance and I'll go ahead, just like in the last video, I'll call this distance gamma, right? This is going to have some distance gamma from our axis of rotation, right? And again, I, our moment of inertia, is just defined as the integral over our object, which in this case I'll say disk, of gamma squared, that distance from the axis of rotation, d m. So next, right, I want to convert this integral into an actual usable form, right? Something that I can actually integrate over this entire disk, right? And right now, with it in this form with uh, d m here, I can't do that. I need to convert this into a 2D integral, right? And the way that I can do that is I can very simply just invoke the definition of mass density, right? So sigma, which is an area mass density, that's what this symbol represents. This is going to be defined as my little infinitesimal change in mass per each little change in area, right? And because we have a uniform disk, this is equal to my total mass divided by the total area of my disk, which is pi r squared, right? So let's go ahead and rewrite this. If I know that sigma times dA equals dm, right? I'm really just rearranging this first statement here. You can almost think of it as multiplying, you know, both sides by dA. Although, you know, mathematicians don't like to uh, describe it that way. Uh, that's not formally correct, but it's the same idea, right? Then I can substitute in for dm, right? This is going to be the integral of gamma squared times sigma, times sigma dA, and this is still over my disk. Okay, cool. And sigma, again, this is just a constant, so I can pull it out of the integral. Uh, here, I'll just rewrite this out. Okay, cool, we're making progress. So next, I need to choose a convenient coordinate system, right, to actually define what dA is and how I'm actually going to define the boundaries of my integral over this region that I've called my disk, right? So in order to do that, right, we're going to use polar coordinates. A very appropriate choice because again, this disk is really just a, uh, a circle, right? So here we go. I'm just gonna go ahead and redraw out what my disk is going to look like. And we know that the way 
that polar coordinates work as each and every point is going to be described. So I'm just going to put a point here is going to be described with some radius, which I'm going to call gamma, right? Doing this very uh, intentionally to match the, the gamma that I use to define the distance of each of my uh, mass elements, right? And then each point is also going to be at some location uh, phi. And so how do I come up with my area elements from this? Well, this is very nice and simple, right? I can just imagine that I start at some point and first at a fixed angle, I'm going to have a small change in gamma. I'm just going to define a small change in gamma and I'm going to call this d gamma, right? So I stayed in the same angle and I just moved out a little bit, right? And so the uh, so there's my next point. And next, at some fixed gamma, I'm going to change phi just a little bit, right? So I'm going to traverse just like a little arc, right? And we can imagine tracing this back to the origin. And we have some very small change in angle, d phi right? And so here's point two. And we just kind of put together, you know, a little area element from this. And I'm going to go ahead and draw this over on the side here. Do, do, do. Right, a little bit blown up so we can more, you know, clearly see each of these little elements, right? And so I already labeled that this this is going to be d gamma, right? And now, what about this arc length? Well, the arc length, if we're at some gamma, right, this gamma here times d phi, right? If you take the radius and multiply by the angle that our arc sweeps out, then that's just going to give me the arc length, right? So there we go. And really, in the limit down, in the limit down, as these little area elements become infinitely small, so infinitely small area elements, we can imagine these more or less looking like little boxes, right? And again, this little box is going to have uh, some length d gamma and some width of gamma times d phi. So what's our area element dA then? Well, dA is simply going to be equal to gamma times d gamma d phi. Fantastic, right? We didn't need to memorize anything. We could just see very logically, we could see this come about just by defining a, a polar coordinate system that an area element in that polar coordinate system is equal to gamma times d gamma times d phi, right? And so that we're just going to substitute in for dA. So let's go ahead and rewrite this integral. So we have sigma times, and now we have a double integral that we're going to have to define the boundaries for, and we'll do that next. But we have gamma cubed, right? See if when we plug that in, we're going to get a gamma cubed times d gamma d phi. Awesome. So for a disk, where's gamma going to range from? Well, we start at our origin and we want to integrate over this entire disk. So we're going to go from zero, a radius of zero, all the way to a radius of capital R. So we're going to integrate this from zero to R. And for phi, Right, we start at some angle of, of uh, zero radians, 
And to integrate over the entire disk, right, we're going to go from 0 to 2 pi radians. We want to go over the entire circle. So we're going to go from 0 to 2 pi radians. Awesome. Let's go ahead and do this integral. This is really quick, right? This is just going to be equal to sigma times integral from 0 to 2 pi of 1 fourth gamma to the fourth. And we're going to evaluate this guy from 0 to r. And we're going to get from this sigma times integral from 0 to 2 pi. Oh, whoops, I forgot to write out a little d phi here. That's OK. 1 fourth r to the fourth d phi. Sweet. And this is just going to end up giving us sigma times pi over 2 times r to the fourth. Sweet. So lastly, we just need to plug in for sigma, right? And I already noted at the very beginning that sigma is equal to m over pi r squared. So m over pi r squared times pi over 2 times r to the fourth. Pi's cancel. This is going to cancel out, give us an r squared. And we derive our final result, which is that the moment of inertia of this disk, whoops, I'll use this with an arrow, the moment of inertia of our disk is equal to m r squared over 2. Fantastic.